Welcome back to the symposium. I'm Jen Malinsky, um, Senior Research Associate at the Joint Center, and I lead the center's work on housing and aging populations. So I'm particularly excited about this panel this morning, as I think these three papers will really add to our understanding of the financial benefits and challenges of homeownership in later life. I just want to take a moment to sort of set a little context for this panel. Households in their late 70s have the highest homeownership rate of all age groups. The homeownership rate, um, last, our last report for those 65 and older was 78.7%. And 31% of US homeowners are 65 and older, um, a, a rate that is only a share that's only going to grow as the population ages. Um, roughly 40% of those owners still have mortgages on their property. And we have seen that the cost burdens with those with mortgages are significantly higher than those without. And as you um, look ahead towards those in their 80s, um, the cost burden rate approaches those of those who are renters. So um, some significant issues there. But at the same time, as we might um, assume and as we discussed yesterday, owners have accumulated far more wealth over their lifetimes than renters. The median income of a renter 65 and over, I mean the median wealth, I'm sorry, of a renter 65 and older is just $6,700 um, compared to the median owner's net wealth of $390,000, which includes the home. Um, so as we know, and lower income older owners are likely to have most of that wealth tied up in their homes. So as the older population continues to grow, understanding the role of ownership, equity, and mortgage debt in, um, and how it plays into health and well-being and financial security is going to become increasingly important. So with that, I want to turn it over to Patrick and Velma, who are going to jointly present the first paper. Good morning. My Good morning. name is Velma Zahirovich Herbert, and no relation to Chris Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with the University of Georgia, and my co-author and I will do something a little different this morning. You will hear from both Patrick and me. Um, and that's in part because we are working with the restricted data with the HRS, and so Patrick led the application for restricted data use, and then I'll let him talk about the specifics of our empirical strategy. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of motivation behind the study, and I think Jan, you stole my uh, introduction. <laughs> so um, it just give you an introduction of why we wanted to look into this issue and where our research fits in the context of the studies that uh, we already have. So as um, Jan mentioned, and I might add to these, that um, on an average, about 10,000 baby boomers reach the age of 65 every day. And this pattern is expected to go well into the next decade or so. And so the importance of retirement preparedness cannot be underestimated, especially if some studies, even the most optimistic ones, say that over 40% of these people are not really prepared to enter the retirement. So what we wanted to do uh, is look into if there is a relationship between home ownership, housing equity, and how prepared the baby boomers are to retire. Several things that kind of motivated the work. We know that housing equity is key to growing wealth for many households, and in particular, many older homeowners. We also know that this housing wealth is widely distributed. So some of the numbers I'm citing here are older numbers, and they started when our data um, way started. So for example, um, we know that Social Security accounted for 42% of total wealth for a typical family, but that was followed by the primary residence or the equity in the primary residence after the Social Security. When we looked at the empirical research on housing wealth, we noticed that most of this empirical research was on contribution of housing wealth <coughs> to consumption patterns. There wasn't really that much on the saving side. So we set out with the following goal. We wanted to see if unexpected changes in housing wealth impact households' retirement saving decisions. If they do, can we quantify these effects? And we also were fortunate enough to have two cycles in the housing market, so we wanted to see if this effect varies over different housing market cycles. So fairly simple goal. This research is very much in progress, and we are looking forward to receiving comments and suggestions on how to move forward. So here's what we have so far. 
We find that individuals reduce their flow of retirement savings in the response to increasing house prices. But we also find that the individuals who are facing house value growth below their expectations do not designate more money, more of their financial resources to retirement savings. And so we are exploring this direction. Where our research fits in the context of existing research. So what we did is we looked at the research on wealth shocks and consumption, since that was the first pattern we observed the empirical studies focused on. There is a plethora of research on this topic. Researchers mostly show that permanent, or lately they have shown that permanent changes in wealth affect consumer spending, but that most of the changes in wealth are actually, actually transitory in nature, and these transitory changes are uncorrelated with consumption. Other researchers have looked at what type of wealth contributes to consumption changes, and so they find different response depending on what type of wealth has received this wealth shock. And some newer research has also looked at the household's balance sheet and how that balance sheet affects the response to a wealth shock. And we've heard a lot yesterday about the balance sheet and in particular of low-income households. And we also summarized some of the research that looks into the consumption responses of house price changes. So most of the research focused on consumption. Then we turned our attention to retirement research. We have a lot of examples of studies that look at how wealth shocks like lottery winnings or inheritance change labor supply decisions or timing in the retirement. So those effects were well uh, noted. There are several studies that look at how shocks to the housing wealth affect retirement timing. And uh, I think Jackie has done some of the more recent work uh, on, uh, yeah, thank you <laughs> for pointing it out, uh, on that topic. So, however, the findings across these studies are not too clear. Some find that there is no effect at all. Others find that there is an effect on the state <laughs> preference as to when to retire, but actually no effect on actual retirement. And the study I mentioned finds that actually these housing shocks do indeed affect retirement decisions. And these housing shocks to the wealth can also be uh, broken down into expected and unexpected changes in housing wealth. So how do we contribute to the research? Again, we look at the propensity to save out of these, uh, or to save into the retirement accounts for, out because of the unexpected changes in housing wealth. So we try to differentiate between expectations and unexpected changes. We show that these house prices or the effect of house price changes can go deeper than just looking at the retirement timing, also looking at retirement readiness. And again, our empirical analysis spans two time periods. So we can actually look at if there is a response um, that corresponds to um, both increases and decreases in housing wealth. And so with that, I'm going to give it over to my co-author to tell you a little bit about the empirical side and data analysis. Right, thanks, Velma. Uh, do I get the new clock? <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, so my job is going to take you through the methodology and uh, show you the preliminary results. Uh, so more specifically, what we are doing in this study, we are looking at the flows of uh, savings into the defined contribution retirement plans. It's uh, <coughs> caused by what is available in the data. HRS, I think, uh, Velma already mentioned, is our uh, primary data set here. And uh, also, she mentioned that those seminal theories of uh, you know, life cycle hypothesis or permanent income, they, they predict that it's only those temporary uh, shocks that should be saved, right? And uh, all those permanent uh, changes, they should be already incorporated into the saving <coughs> consumption plan. Uh, so we try to isolate those uh, shocks that are, uh, you know, uh, temporary, right? And uh, the way we do it is actually a big shout out to the last row here because we are following the example from the past literature. So what we essentially do is we, uh, uh, we predict uh, the, you know, the evolution of prices, uh, the, the house prices in the local areas. Uh, using the autoregressive model, so we are using the lags of the past prices, 
And then based on those models, we, we make the prediction, and then we calculate the difference, the discrepancy between the observed and uh, those predicted prices. And we actually do this at the, so the predictions are done at the uh, county level, even though our data comes at the zip code level. And, and the thinking here is that we are trying to preserve the sample size, uh, and also it's less sensitive to outliers. Um, if there's questions, I can answer those uh, more detail later. Uh, so our primary data set is health and retirement study. It's 2000 to 2012, and uh, the, the data on the price uh, of housing is uh, from the core logic. And I'm not actually a housing economist, so I guess that most of you probably know this data set uh, better than I do, even though I did the work on it. <laughs> uh, but it's a California-based company that combines all the data on the housing market trends uh, into one file, easy to work with. So we use this restricted version of the HRS to merge this uh, whole price uh, data into the HRS. And our sample is people who are actively employed homeowners under 17 and a half years old. That's the legal restriction when you can make tax deductible contributions to your retirement accounts. And uh, because the, the wording of the question that uh, asks about defined contribution of uh, plan contributions, uh, it is only uh, asked to those people who have those plans with current employers, so that's uh, another necessary limitation on our sample. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of the descriptive statistics. You can see the, the total amount of contribution here. Uh, it's slightly over $7,000, $7,500. Uh, those are all in 2012 uh, dollars. Uh, you can see the average resale value of homes in the respondent zip code. So we are only using the data on the old homes, right? So it's the resale value. We are excluding the new homes from this. Uh, you can see this unexpected part. So that's the deviation between uh, what is observed and what is expected. Uh, it is about 2000 uh, actually more than two and a half thousand, but you will see that there's some variability in this measure. I don't really have the time to take you through all those descriptive statistics. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Uh, this one shows you the, the comparison of the distribution of observed prices and uh, those predicted prices. So the blue are observed. You can see clearly that for the first three waves, 2002, 2004, 2006, that's the uptrend, right, that we were all aware of. Uh, the expectations were also growing. Those are the, the red boxes, but they were growing at a slower pace. So as a consequence, people probably expected, uh, or not expected, but experienced uh, a positive surprise uh, in this period. And then you can see that those expectations and uh, projections are more aligned. And what is probably not clear here is that uh, most people actually experienced a negative surprise here. So uh, I break those descriptive statistics into two columns here. You have pre-2006 and post-2006. And you can see uh, the contributions were still growing, but uh, for example, this surprise factor. So you know, before 2006, uh, the gap was positive, right, like observed versus expected, and after it was actually negative. Uh, there's some more stuff which, again, I probably don't have the time to explain, uh, so maybe we'll come through the results. Uh, so the first multivariate results that I'm going to show you are the log of uh, dependent, uh, the dependent variable is the log of the uh, uh, flows to the defined contribution plans. The key independent variable here is the, uh, it's actually the observed, so we start with observed prices measured at the zip code level. And uh, I'm actually comparing, what you see here is actually 90% confidence intervals and point estimates. The one on the left is based on cross-sectional comparisons. This one incorporates individual fixed effects. This is a big list of the control variables that we include in this. So uh, some of the key things that we control is uh, local area unemployment, uh, month of interview, stock market performance. We control for all those like financial characteristics of people. Uh, also, you know, if there's employer contributions to their plans, uh, if they are over the tax limit already. Uh, which is actually something that is new. It wasn't in the paper that we submitted yet. It's work in progress, uh, uh, being eligible for social security and so on. Uh, so you can see that this estimate actually shows that there is this negative effect, right? So if your uh, if local area prices go up by 10%, uh, your contribution, your flow of contributions decreases by about 3.8%. Uh, this is the set of results, very similar setup, but here we are using those unexpected uh, prices. So again, uh, comparison of cross-sectional and those within estimations. Uh, so the one on the right is probably more uh, the one that is more of interest, uh, and it shows you that the 10 percent increase in this unexpected, so that you know the, the uh, difference, discrepancy between observed and expected, right? Uh, it is uh, reducing the flow of contributions by about one percent. Uh, we do some placebo tests here, so we incorporate uh, renters into the sample and create the dummy for being a homeowner, and then interact uh, this dummy with a uh, house price uh, variable. And uh, of course, what we expect here is that uh, you know the, those renters are not going to be affected by the movement of prices to the same degree as homeowners. Uh, so we expect that there's going to be a negative sign on those interaction uh, effects. And we actually observe negative uh, uh, sign of the coefficient, but it's only significant for 
cross-sectional comparisons. Uh, and at the same time, I, we, we kind of acknowledge that the validity of this placebo test is, you know, it hinges on the assumption that the, the renters are not affected by changes in the price values, but that may not necessarily be true because, of, you know, they may experience exactly the opposite to the homeowners, right? It's a negative shock in the sense that if the house prices increase, the, the rent actually probably will increase as well, right? So they'll have less money. Uh, we also estimate instrument of variable models, so we actually want to look at the more heterogeneous effect of those movements in pricing, uh, uh, housing prices uh, on the retirement saving behavior. So we use uh, two instruments. One is just those observed prices in those local uh, area in, in zip codes. Uh, the second one is the unexpected portion of the price change. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, I, I'm still not clear in my mind why people do not update. Uh, so what, what is the key independent variable here in the, uh, in the second stage is, of course, the self-reported home value. So we instrument the self-reported home value with either observed or unexpected uh, portion of the change in price. And uh, something that is kind of surprising to me is that people do not really update the, uh, you know, the, how they value their house, the house that they own, based on those unexpected the discrepancy between observed and uh, what we predict uh, should be the change in the price. Uh, so it's not really a very strong instrument, so I'm not going to even show you those results. For the first instrument, when we just use the zip code level prices as they are, uh, the observed, uh, they actually are a very good instrument. They're a very strong instrument, and the result that you can see here, so one person increasing the value of home, home is associated with about 1.9% decline in the annual flow of contribution uh, of funds money to the contribution, uh, defined contribution. I'm also going to show you some back of the envelope calculations, what this translates into, what this translates into uh, at the sample uh, means. And finally, Velma actually also mentioned that what we are doing is uh, trying to see if there is a difference in, uh, in the behavior when you experience this positive surprise versus negative surprise. So what we do here is uh, we create those two dummies. One of them shows the positive uh, surprise, so it's when the discrepancy between observed and um, projected price is greater than positive $10,000. Uh, an equivalent negative surprise is when the discrepancy is actually lower than the negative $10,000, and $10,000 is kind of arbitrarily selected here. Uh, so what you can see is that uh, it's only this uh, positive surprise that is actually affecting uh, the flows to the retirement savings. Uh, there is absolutely no effect of the negative surprise. And uh, I don't know, I don't really have a good explanation for this other than maybe common sense that it might be just easier to reduce your contribution when you feel the wealth shock that is positive, and it's probably more difficult to you know, increase your contributions when you feel poorer, right, because your house value just declined. Uh, so finally, the last slide, the summary is uh, those back of the envelope calculations that I <coughs> promised. Uh, so what you can see here is that this simulation at sample means, so $10,000 increase in the average uh, local area home value reduces the annual contributions to these plans by, by about $90.88 at some point means uh, the second bullet, uh, so the 10,000 unexpected increase in the average local uh, home value reduces annual contributions uh, to the DC plans by about 240. So the bigger magnitude of this estimate of course is expected, uh, it's consistent with theory because the, the observed blends together both expected and unexpected change, right? And uh, this one is actually from the IV model, so 10,000 increase in the perceived value of owned home. Um, it reduces the contribution. Sorry for the mistake, there's too many reduces in this sentence. Uh, I shouldn't have noticed, uh, I shouldn't have said this, so you wouldn't notice it. <laughs> uh, so it reduces the, uh, the contribution by about $400. And again, the effect seems to be caused by, uh, by those positive world surprises, not, not people you know, experiencing the negative uh, surprises and then maximizing or increasing the contribution. And uh, we, we, like I said, we don't, other than the common sense explanation, we don't, we haven't really done much more testing what might be going on here. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Marker from the Center for Retirement Research at BC, and I'm happy to be here to discuss this uh, paper, a really interesting paper. Uh, as the author said, housing is an important source of wealth for households near retirement. This is just showing some data from the SCF. 
um, back in 2013, but the 2016 numbers look very similar. And the primary house is, um, you know, a major source of wealth for the median household, um, bigger than DC wealth. It's it's um, for a lot of households their biggest source of, of wealth approaching retirement. And the interplay between housing wealth and retirement uh, wealth is important. Um, in theory, whether a dollar of wealth is held in a house or a retirement account shouldn't really matter. You can always access that wealth. Um, in theory, in actuality, the distribution between the two sources really does matter. Um, it, as the authors find, if an increase in housing wealth decreases retirement wealth by less than one to one, then households would reach retirement with more wealth, which I guess in theory would be a good thing. Unfortunately, those are also resources that people are unlikely to spend. So. Um, how, uh, housing wealth is just drawn down in a much lower rate than other kinds of wealth or retirement. Uh, I think, you know, uh, 401ks, the withdrawal rate tends to be pretty similar to the rate of return, about 5%. Uh, with housing, it's more like 25 to 3% on average. So housing wealth is just withdrawn more slowly. And so having wealth shift towards housing wealth is not, not necessarily equivalent to just more, more wealth. Um, and this just shows that the basic issue is that no one plans to tap home equity. Um, and few do unless, unless there's an emergency. Almost nobody uses reverse mortgages. Um, no one wants to use them and no one does use them. Uh, if you look at downsizing, people tend to only do that in case of an emergency. Um, other methods of withdrawing equity from one's home, uh, one that we've really become interested in are property tax deferral programs that allow you to use your home equity to defer paying property taxes. Those also, um, at this point, aren't very popular. And so, Housing wealth, as much as it is kind of a monetary form of wealth that people should be able to access, they, they don't. So the distribution between the two things is, is really important. And so this research is, is important. Um, so it's valuable. Um, as the authors mentioned, other work has found a relationship between decisions near retirement, um, labor supply decisions mostly, um, and housing wealth. Um, others, uh, Alicia Minnell and Mauricio Soto at, at, at CRR, uh, found that the housing boom triggered more debt for refinancing. And I think a lot of that debt is still working its way through the system. Um, uh, but this study, I think, is unique in looking at the effect of a boom specifically on retirement saving through employer-sponsored um, plans. And so I think it's, uh, it is interesting work. And uh, you know, the, the findings suggest that unexpected housing wealth reduces savings in retirement plans. Um, and the same thing is not true of unexpected decreases in value. So the housing bubble bursting did not trigger increased savings in retirement vehicles, which, you know, as the authors work through this, if that's true, that is somewhat troubling. Um, and the others point out that the effect is non-trivial. Uh, appreciation of $10,000 would reduce housing wealth by retirement by about $3,000. So it's not a, not a trivial effect at all. I would say that the finding is also, to me, somewhat unexpected. Uh, in, in general, employer plan participants are thought to be inertial. Um, the idea of defaults and kind of people on a track and they tend to stay there um, is kind of the common way of thinking about people's behavior in DC accounts. And so. Um, the finding that they, they do adjust their behavior is somewhat surprising, although there are expe uh, exceptions to this view. A paper by Mueller and Turner used the PSID and did find that people responded to certain um, changes in the stock market by changing their contribution rates. Um, but these findings suggest that when workers experience an unexpected boost in their house value, they make an active decision to reduce their savings in their 401ks. And I think that, that does go against the grain of what I would have expected, that people just kind of continue doing what, what they do and don't really respond very much to changes uh, with respect to these contributions. And so the, the one concern I had that I wanted to bring up was the, the dependent variable choice is driving the results. So the authors use the log of 401k contributions as a dollar amount as their main dependent variable. Um, and the way, I, the way I typically think about my 401k is that I contribute some share of my salary and the, the choice that I make is centered around that choice, what percent of my salary should I contribute um, as a share of my earnings. So I, I wouldn't necessarily think about, okay, I'm going to contribute $5,000 in my 401k this year, I think I'm going to contribute uh, X percent of my salary. Um, and so the one thing that worried me is that the choice means that the result could be driven by correlation between unexpected house price increases and lower real wage growth, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but I'll talk about why it could be an issue um, on the next slide. Um, and so one thing I thought would really be really valuable as the authors think about this work is running, running the results on actually, uh, actually on uh, contribution rates as a dependent variable. Um, negative correlation between house price increases and real wages seems counterintuitive to me. That's what would lead to this result, and that doesn't really seem very intuitive. But the states where house values increased the most, California, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, um, may not have been economically representative. It may not really have been experiencing great economies. I think a lot of those price increases are driven by speculation. So it's unclear how much that would be correlated with real wage growth necessarily. So I guess it is possible that you have 
it's possible you'd have declines in uh, real wage growth in some of these places. Now, the office control for unemployment at the local level, and so in some ways, it may be dealing with some of this. But I think, you know, kind of controlling for the, the at least for me, the more intuitive variable may be helpful in making sure this concern isn't driving some of the results. Um, and it may also result in a more intuitive way to present results that people, you know, as their house value goes up, they decrease the contribution rate by X percent, like the best way to present it. Um, so that was, that was one concern. The other, the smaller concern is just the number of variables and significant levels in the regression. Um, I think a lot of regressions contain a large number of variables, fairly low R squared, and so um, just some kind of correction to deal with the fact that there are a lot of controls um, and a few significant results uh, may be something worth, worth looking into um, as the authors go forward with this research. But in general, the paper is on a really important topic. I think the distribution of, you know, a lot of times we think about wealth approaching retirement as, as somewhat holistic. You know, you have your housing wealth, you have your social security wealth, DV wealth, uh, kind of going away, you have your 401k wealth. Um, and, and a lot of times we lump those things together, but understanding how they're distributed and how those things interact is really important because people don't withdraw those things at similar rates when they retire. And so having all your money in a house means you may be kind of consumption poor in retirement even though these, these assets are there. And so these interactions are really important. Um, recent changes to the federal tax code that should they become permanent could cause house values to drop in some markets unexpectedly um, as kind of the tax treatment of the state and local taxes changes. And so, you know, thinking about this paper in the context of those changes may be a valuable way to present the results and also a way to think about why they're important. But um, overall, I think it's, it's interesting work. So let me talk about it. the discussing comments. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, so thank you for having me here. Um, this is joint work with actually my co-author, Don Hart, is, is here in the audience, so you can ask him a little bit difficult. He's questions. retired, I thought. Um, <laughs> he's not really retired. <laughs> um, and then also um, Cecilia Leibel, uh, who's also at the Ohio State University, and then Chrissy Edmonds, who's our research assistant on this uh, project. So the last paper actually set this up perfectly, and I think also those, the comments that you made about housing wealth and retirement. Um, this has been an issue that uh, my co-authors and I have been, have been wrestling with for the last six or seven years on a couple of different projects, trying to explore the use of home equity in retirement. Particularly, we've been focusing on that reverse mortgage that you mentioned. <laughs> um, but we've also been looking at other types of home equity borrowing in retirement, um, the prevalence of it, and then what happens after people borrow from home equity. And this has led us to start to think about um, not just uh, the rates of borrowing, but does this actually impact well-being? So, I mean, part of this conference, I think, is to think about what are the long, what are the impacts of, of housing tenure and home ownership on um, kind of well-being for individuals. And so, we're kind of pushing us to that question a little bit here with, by looking at food insecurity as one indicator of kind of economic uh, well-being. Um, I'm not sure if this is maybe I'm not doing it right. This is the <laughs> oh. Is Oh, I'll click it. That's fine. I think it's just not working. Okay. Um, so motivation. So um, food insecurity, uh, some of you may be familiar with this research. This was actually somewhat new to us in our research team. Um, but it's really a severe form of economic hardship. So if we think about when people are going to cut down on consumption, food is probably one of the last things they're going to cut down on. So we saw this as a severe form of economic hardship if individuals report going without food because of costs. Um, and we were surprised to learn, as of 2016, um, close to 10 million or older adults are facing this threat. Um, it's about 14% of the population age 60 and older, and there was actually a 27% increase since 2001. Um, so even though we think about Social Security, retirement income being a stable source of income for this group, there's still an issue of food insecurity. Um, and in fact, some of you that do some work on social support programs may know that food stamp take up, for example, is the lowest among the elderly of any group, any demographic group in the country. Um, so there's, there's other issues related to that as well. Um, and, and food insecurity is important, not just for food insecurity, but also because it can be related to other poor outcomes, uh, poor health outcomes, mental health outcomes, higher health care utilization, and then obviously higher mortality at the end if you're not, if you're not consuming a right amount of calories and food. Um, and actually, there's been some research that's shown, and, and as we were digging into this space, Nobody's really looked at home equity carefully with food insecurity, um, but there's this finding that wealth is a more important predictor of food insecurity than income. 
which for, for, for seniors, for older adults, not for younger populations, but for older adults. But you, when you think about this, well, fixed income for older adults, a lot of them receiving Social Security, but there's a lot of heterogeneity and wealth among this population. So maybe this isn't that surprising. Um, but that led us to think about, well, what is the primary form of wealth for these older adults? It's, it's home equity. And um, it, you can't eat your house, which will be something that comes up later. So, so what's driving this finding, right? Um, and so we looked at, you know, this is from some of our other, other work, but in 2016, I think you mentioned 78%, about 80% of older adults own the home. Equity in the home, for those who are in the bottom 40th percentile of the income distribution, comprises almost 70% of their total wealth. Um, and if we look at the top part of the income distribution, the top 20%, it's only about 24%. So this is the majority of wealth for many of these people who are likely at risk for food insecurity. Um, and so this shows you also one of the findings that we did find in the food insecurity literature, and you see this again and again, homeowners are less likely to be food insecure. And they'll often use the home ownership status as a dummy or a proxy for, um, for, for housing wealth. They don't really explore it, but they just say, oh, home ownership, being a, a homeowner makes you less food insecure. So we looked at this in the HRS. This is the 2014 Health and Retirement Study. And you see this again. So among renters, um, so this is a kind of a conservative question that the USDA developed that asks if you've skipped food um, in the last two years because of cost. Um, and here you see that uh, renters, uh, you know, 16.21% of the renters um, say this. But when we compare that to homeowners, it's much smaller. But then we decided to break it out by home equity percentile. And you see this varies a lot for the higher income groups, or not higher income, sorry, the, the higher home equity folks that are, are much less likely to stay the same way without food than the lower home equity folks. <coughs> so what are they doing? Um, so this is like kind of their research. The other thing that's interesting, so even though we're going to focus on homeowners here, and food insecurity among homeowners on average is pretty low. So when we, when we put all the uh, groups together, there's tercels together, in our sample it ends up being about 5% are food insecure, 5-7% to 7 are food insecure um, at any, any given point in time. So you can see that the green line here is the 1996 <coughs> We want to look at the same people over time. Let's look at the folks that were 60 or older in 1996 and follow them over time. Um, and you can see, you know, as they uh, age, uh, they likely start getting Social Security benefits, and then so there's a drop in their food insecurity. But then there's volatility over time. And what we found is that about 26% of seniors during, or sorry, 25% from 1996 to 2014 have one time or another in one of those surveys said that they were food insecure, which we thought was quite shocking. Um, versus, you know, if you look at just a cross-sectional wave, you only see this being, um, you know, about 4 to 6%. All right, so we're drawing on, so our question is quite simple. Does housing wealth reduce food insecurity? Um, and we're drawing on that literature that was mentioned previously um, about the consumption, how wealth and consumption. Obviously, uh, food is a, food is, a, is a form of consumption. Um, I think Gary might have a paper on this, like way back using PSID data, where you were looking at um, uh, food consumption uh, and, and, uh, and housing wealth. And then prior studies have also looked at home ownership status, like we mentioned, and, and seeing that's associated with reduced food insecurity, but we wanted to start looking at the mechanism. So does borrowing from home equity actually reduce food insecurity? Um, so uh, just to make it really simple, um, so this is in 2014, we're looking at the food insecurity for an individual in 2014, but then we're going to look at some changes in their um, use of home equity prior to 2014. Um, so uh, we, we have a leg measure food insecurity as of 2008. Um, you'll see why we use 2008. Uh, 2008, we're going to look at the change in um, equity from 2008 to 2012, and then look at 2014 outcomes. Um, so we put in that lag measure of food insecurity in 2008, it's kind of a baseline control. Um, and then we have that lag measure of housing wealth, um, and then financial wealth, um, as well as other variety of demographic and control variables. We're going to measure the housing wealth in three different ways. So we're going to start really simple, and we're going to do what I think others have done, um, and a lot of the consumption literature literature did, and they looked at the exogenous house price change. So they looked to see whether or not exogenous house price changes are associated with reduced food insecurity. And a lot of them will find, oh, look, uh, house price changes are associated with um, changes in consumption. People consume more when there's, when there's an increase in house prices. Again, there's so many questions about why that might be, um, but that's we, we start with that. Then we're going to start measuring endogenous changes in home equity. So we're going to treat the change in home equity as endogenous. We're going to model it in a two-stage model. First, predict the change in home equity for an individual, and then predict their food insecurity. Um, still, that change in home equity may or may not mean they actually used it. It could just be that their home equity increased because house prices changed, but they didn't actually borrow from it. So again, they're not necessarily, we might not expect that to reduce food insecurity. And then the third thing we're going to do is actually model new mortgage borrowing from 2008 to 2012. So in the HRS, we can see whether or not their mortgages have increased. 
Um, there's three types of mortgage borrowing that we observe. So one is home equity lines of credit. So you can see if somebody's taken out a home equity line of credit or drawn a home <coughs> equity line of credit from 8 to 12. Um, cash out refinancing of a first mortgage, which we did. The home equity lines of credit are the first most prevalent. Then you see cash out refinancing of a, a first mortgage. Um, and so that's when you see the balance of that first mortgage increase, but they didn't move. Um, and then we also can look at uh, second means that they might draw out. Um, and I'll say about 15% of our people during this uh, sample period from 2008 to 2012 extract home equity. So to somebody's point, it's not a huge proportion, right? Um, and so we know, I think that's what you said, Jeffrey. It's not, it's not a lot of people in this period that are doing it, but about 15% of people are um, at some point during the 2008 to 2012 period. And the average amount is about $60,000 that they withdraw at any given, uh, when, they, when they make that extraction. Um, we're limiting our sample to homeowners who do not move. I want to put that caveat there. This is a simplification others have used when looking at HRS. The challenge is you could also you know, liquidate your housing wealth by selling your home and then take that money and use it for consumption. Um, we're, we're simplifying our analysis right now and we're sticking to homeowners who don't move. But this is truly people who are tapping the equity in their home. Um, and then we have instruments for that first stage that I talked about where we uh, treat those um, home equity change and then also mortgage borrowing as endogenous. So we used leg measured mortgage delinquency in 2008, expecting that you're not as likely to be able to get a home equity loan if you were delinquent on your mortgage previously. Um, the number of bank branches in your zip code. So we're using the restricted HRS data that has zip code so that we can merge in information about bank branches as well as house prices. And then we used a leg measure of new mortgage borrowing in the prior period. So from 2004 to 2006, um, to see if that predicts your future borrowing. Um, so we're using the health and retirement study. I think everybody in this panel is using, right? Are you using it too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're all using the health and retirement study. Um, and we're using the restricted geocoded data, which the first one did, and I'm guessing you guys are using it as well, um, which is nice because we can then merge in house prices at the zip code level. Um, we're using the data from 2004 to 2014. We limit it to one respondent per household, which again is an oversimplification, um, but we want to limit it to the financial respondent. All of our wealth and, and income variables are at the household level, um, and then the food insecurity is the individual level. Um, and we limit it to homeowners who did not move between 2006 and 2014. We end up with about 4,000 households. Um, and we're merging in the Federal Housing Finance Agency zip code level house price indices. Um, and our outcomes are food insecurity. So in this sample of non-moving homeowners, you see that it's only about 4.6% that said that they've always had enough money to buy, or didn't have always have enough money to buy the food that they need. So it's a pretty low rate of food insecurity among the sample in 2014. But remember, there's volatility. So we expect people, you know, even though in this period we only see 4.6%, there's going to be um, some movement in that. And then severe food insecurity, we estimate the robustness test, and this is of the people that say this, they actually said that they ate less because they felt there wasn't enough money to buy food. Um, so it's a measure of severe food insecurity. And our results are robust to both variables, so I'll just kind of put that out there. I'm going to show you the results for the first, but really you, you see very similar results with the second dependent variable as well. Um, all right, so descriptive statistics that I think are interesting for this group. Um, so we can compare the, the food secure folks to the food insecure folks. And it's only about 200 people that were food insecure in 2014. But a few things pop out. And in light of our discussion, um, one of the things that pops out is how much housing wealth percent of their total uh, wealth for those that, are, that experienced food insecurity in 2014. Um, you can see that their total wealth, when I add up um, you know, the, the home equity plus the financial assets of only 40, uh, $4,000, um, or yeah, that's $40,000, these are all in $10,000 units, as well as their other financial assets. Their total wealth is about $192,000 for the food insecure folks, but their housing wealth is $109,000. So we're looking at about 60% of their total uh, wealth is in, is in their home. Um, compared to the, the folks that are food secure, their total wealth is almost $500,000, their housing wealth is $190,000, and about 40% of their total wealth is in their home. And we can see also they have lower incomes, obviously, so the food insecure folks have lower incomes. And you actually do see a higher rate of mortgage borrowing among food insecure folks. So this gets us to treating it as endogenous. So one of the things that we first realized, like the folks who have tried to model SNAP participation, um, you see that SNAP, people that are eligible for SNAP, or if you just put a dummy in as to whether you participate in SNAP, which is the food stamp program, you actually find that positively correlated with food insecurity. So food stamps cause you know, people to not eat. Um, and in fact, no, that's not true. <laughs> it's endogenous, right? And so we see something similar with mortgage borrowing, where if you just drop it in there, you might actually get, I think it was insignificant, if I remember. I'm not sure that it was positively predictive. Do you remember if it was? Significant. It was significant. All right, so it's actually like just like SNAP, and it's positive and statistically significant. But when we treat it as endogenous, you'll see we, because the sign actually flips. Um, and so part of this is, is because people that are food insecure are more likely to need to borrow. 
Um, all right, and this just gives you some other demographics. I'm going to skip over these, um, but it's probably what you would expect. People that are minorities um, and also less educated more likely to be food insecure. <coughs> Um, so here are the results. So we have a two-stage probate model for the endogenous. When we, so this is actually kind of a combination of the different models. Um, so we first model house price um, by itself without including the other components, and we treat house prices as uh, exogenous. Um, and these are just the probate coefficients. So we can interpret this as the change in the z-score for a one-unit change in our independent variable. But this was just going to give you a sense of the magnitude. And these are all statistically significant variables. So these were the ones that were statistically significant from our analyses. Um, you see this great big, you know, house price change causes people to have better food security. But really, I mean, are they, what are they doing with that? And so then we start modeling um, the changes in the home equity, and you see there's some um, reduction in food insecurity from a change in home equity when treated as endogenous, but you see a larger uh, reduction in food insecurity when we model the, that new mortgage borrowing when you treat that as endogenous. Um, and this is, in fact, greater than actually income uh, by itself didn't have an effect but you do see it's actually similar in size. So a $10,000 increase in mortgage borrowing. So these are all the $10,000 units. So a one unit increase is a $10,000 increase. It's about similar in size to um, the opposite direction of an increase of food insecurity for somebody who is below 30, 130% of poverty. But to help interpret this, we've actually, you know, with, with a two-stage probate model, it's hard to just even use marginal effects. So we just did some predictive probabilities. So we assume a, <coughs> a typical person in our sample who's food insecure. So we're going to take a married black man who's 70 years old. He has home equity of $50,000. He has financial assets of $10,000 and a month monthly income of $1,500, so he's below the poverty line. And he was food insecure in 2008. Now we're going to let him, um, actually, so his baseline predictive level of food insecurity is actually quite high, 56%. Um, we're going to let him uh, withdraw $10,000 of that equity through a mortgage um, between 2008 and 2012. And we, we, we actually reduce his predictive probability of food insecurity to 47.8%, which is a reduction of about 15%. Um, in alternative specifications, um, we actually model both uh, home equity and um, borrowing together. Ideally, what we'd love to see is we can drive out that home equity uh, coefficient, the significance on the home equity coefficient altogether. We can explain it all with borrowing. We can't. So this is a bit of a head scratcher. It makes you wonder what else maybe home equity can be capturing. That change in home equity may be picking up on something else, um, or there's some asset reallocation going on. They're spending from other. You still find that home equity is a significant predictor of um, reduced food insecurity, even when you model mortgage borrowing. Um, and we also see that there, and this is something that we thought we might see, that there's a nonlinear effect of mortgage borrowing on food insecurity. So smaller amounts of mortgage borrowing have a greater impact of food insecurity, and then you see that it actually decreases after that, which makes sense. Um, so people that are drawing a little bit may have less housing wealth total to draw from, um, and that may also <coughs> the smaller amounts may actually impact food insecurity at a, a greater extent. Um, so discussion. Um, one of the big things we find mortgage borrowing is endogenous just like food stamps. So if you just model mortgage borrowing or just drop that in your equation, it's going to look like people who borrow from mortgages are moved more food insecure. Um, and so it's important to treat it as endogenous. Um, but borrowing from a mortgage is not a panacea. And so this also, you know, we've been scratching our heads a lot about this too. Um, you know, low, first of all, low and credit constrained homeowners may not be able to borrow. So there's very people that we looked at who are food insecure, may not be able to qualify for forward mortgages, and may not be able to borrow. Um, also, it can increase the housing cost burden of older adults. And you already mentioned this, Jennifer, at the beginning. I mean, the Joint Center's done some interesting work on housing cost burden, and they show that seniors with a mortgage actually have similar housing cost burdens to renters. Um, and so to, to us, this is, you know, if you're going to take out a mortgage or through borrowing, which is often how we're doing it, and you increase your housing costs, this could be problematic. Um, you know, one thing that we've been working with a bit is the federally uh, insured home equity conversion mortgage, and there are all kinds of issues with that, of course. But it, the, the, the purpose of this, by design, was to allow people to withdraw the equity of their home, home with no monthly payments. We get rid of that housing cost burden aspect. Um, they don't have to leave the home, and there's less underwriting. There is some underwriting now, but it's, it's not as strict. So those folks who are in that food insecure group may be able to tap this. Um, but it can be costly, and there's very low take-up rates, as you note. Um, and so, but I just wanted to show you, we did a survey of people that were counseled for reverse mortgages from 2006 to 2011, and we, we surveyed them in 2015, 2016, so about five years later. And we wanted to ask, and we had a variety of questions, including health outcomes, but one of the questions we had on there was food insecurity. Um, and we asked in the past two years, have you always had enough money to buy the food you need? Of the people counseled, those that got reverse mortgages, um, about 8% of them said no, which is very similar to the homeowners that we see in a general HRS sample. But of those that were counseled, 
them to not get the reverse mortgage. And so this is just the number missing. So there's 1,000 people in the group that got, it's about 430 people that were counseled and didn't get. Um, it's about twice as high. Uh, now, there's various reasons. We cannot say this is causal. It's descriptive. There's reasons why people select out of getting a reverse mortgage, of course. Um, so, but it is a higher level of food insecurity. And even those folks that got the reverse mortgage, we had about 100 people in our sample that got the reverse mortgage and had since terminated it, but were still alive, which is a hard group to find. <laughs> um, many times you terminate the reverse mortgage for dying, but this, these, these people were still alive. And they had about 11% food insecurity at that point. Um, so that's it, uh, but we just wanted to kind of kick off as a discussion, how do we think about, we know the HACM is expensive, we know the HACM is costly, but for older adults that have home equity in their home, it seems like giving them a way to be able to consume from this could be uh, part of the solution. Thank you. Um, I'm Sue In Chan from NYU, and um, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to read this paper. I really enjoyed it. Well done. Um, very, very policy relevant. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you some context about food insecurity in the in the U.S. So this is this I stole this from a USDA um, report. Um, showing that um, showing uh, rates of food insecurity for all households in the U.S. So we're hovering at around 12% right now in, in uh, the, the data from 2017. And the, um, the light blue dotted line is very low food security. Now older adults are, I put in the, the X's there to represent households um, with at least one person over age 65. And they're doing a little better. But you know, as, um, as uh, Stephanie said, it's, it's still a lot of people. And, um, and so we should be concerned. Now, I'm going to argue that food insecurity isn't really about food. It's mm -hmm. about economic insecurity. Um, in the questions that the USDA um, asks uh, to construct these measures, there's a series of um, at least 10 questions. And basically, they, they code you as um, food insecure if you answer often or sometimes to questions like these. And they're all about having money, um, having money, you know, food being affordable. They n don't ask you whether you have um, transportation to get to the supermarket so that you can buy fresh produce. They're not asking you whether you have mobility or dexterity difficulties that prevent you from cooking proper meals. Um, so it's it's so it's really not a measure of whether people have. Um, are eating well or have access to nutritionally <laughs> adequate food. It's, it's really about, it's, but it's a great measure of economic security. So what we're capturing are um, people who are economically fragile. Um, they are making hard trade-offs between buying food or um, buying medicine. They're, you know, they're trading off buying food versus um, paying utility bills. And so I think it's you know, important to bear that in mind, particularly for older adults who are living alone. So um, turning to, the, to, the, to the, the findings in the paper, as Stephanie laid out, there's this long-standing um, uh, finding in the, in the literature that uh, uh, shows an association between food insecurity and um, housing wealth. And so they're trying to unpack the, the mechanism behind this. Right, and they, as she showed you, they find that um, food insecurity is explained by changes in home equity. Um, now, one, one um, concern I had with, the, with um, your, your modeling right now is that you don't take into account um, labor market conditions. And um, the, the age range of your sample you is um, one person in the household age 62 and above in 2014, but you're um, measuring home equity starting from 2008, right? So the age cutoff there is really 56 and above, and then you have the younger spouses who aren't subject to the age cutoff. So like the youngest person in the HRS is like in their 30s. So, um, so because of the correlation between housing markets and labor markets, 
some of what you could be picking up is, you know, people in good labor markets keep their jobs, earn a good living, and then they're food secure. And then in other bad labor markets, they're losing their job and they're food insecure, and you're attributing that to, to housing. So I think just, you know, a few extra controls there would, would, um, would, would capture that. Um, you also then, in a separate model, show the, um, the uh, relationship between food insecurity and new mortgage borrowing, showing that has a big effect. Um, and then you put the, put the two together. And, uh, and, and so you're, you know, you, as you said, you're a little puzzled by the finding. And I, I think there's, um, it's, the interpretation is a, is a little confusing because there's new bor mortgage borrowing in the change in home equity variable as well, yeah. right? And so you're sort of muddying up your, 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 the interpretation. And so I would suggest an alternative specification. You're, this, is what, this is the relationship that you're trying to unpack. So why not decompose it um, into the part of the change in home equity that's due to new mortgage borrowing and then everything else, All right? So, so what I'm proposing is like you have two terms. So the first one is the change in home equity that's due to just exogenous changes in the home value, less any changes in the mortgage balance due to just repaying the principal on your existing mortgage. And then you've got the separate variable that's the, the new mortgage borrowing. And then you can really isolate what's going on. And so I think this should be your main model, right, with the labor markets in there. Um, but, you know, I'm in any case, I'm, I, I believe the story, all right, so let's um, turn to the policy implications. Now, you, you, you mentioned, you know, reverse <coughs> mortgages, and we need, you know, good and, and affordable mechanisms to help households extract their home equity. Um, but I would also emphasize here that we should be encouraging older homeowners to move, right? And, um, you know, you, you this is not in the paper, right? You, you're taking people out who have moved. Um, Jackie um, Begley and I have been working on um, mobility among older adults. And, you know, in the ACS data from over this same time period, um, if you look at people in their 60s and 70s, the annual mobility rate is about 7%, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's low, but it's not, um, it's not zero. And um, it could be much higher. Um, and in particular, we should be encouraging homeowners to move to age-friendly homes and communities, right? So this is not just about, and I know Jen has written a lot about this, um, this is not just an opportunity to extract home equity. It's uh, an opportunity to move to a, uh, a home with um, a bit better physical layout, um, in, you know, to prepare for a future uh, possible mobility challenges with walking or climbing stairs. Um, it's the opportunity to move to um, a different neighborhood, perhaps a denser neighborhood that's less car reliant, um, with more amenities for um, seniors. Um, it's an opportunity to move closer to your family, friends, uh, so you have more social supports. Um, so, so I think, you know, it would be um, a mistake to just focus on the financial instruments um, as, as the implication here. And in terms of encouraging homeowners to move, it's not just a demand side thing. I mean, I would say very much on the, on the supply side, we, we need more options for people to move to in the communities where they already live. So they don't have to ditch their um, networks and, and social capital that they've built up. Uh, so um, making it easier to uh, build uh, multifamily housing, um, which tends to be much more accessible, uh, physically accessible, um, and um, accessory dwelling units. Right. So these are all sort of on 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 the supply side. And then lastly, you know, let's not forget these people with home equity, they're, they're, they're already doing well, right? So we've got to also ensure economic security for people who don't have home equity and, you know, as we saw earlier, who don't have other savings. Thank you.
uh, let us know if you're having trouble hearing. Uh, we can have people mic up. Would it be helpful if people mic up? The speakers mic up? It's okay? It's okay. Never had anybody who has had trouble hearing. Never. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in elementary school, I, the, the only comments that I get on my report card is he refrains from disturbing. Us. He 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 uh, he does not refrain from disturbing. <laughs> us. Uh, and so I, I I have full confidence he'll be able to hear me. Uh, are we recording this though? Is this? It is, is being recorded, yeah. but there are speakers right. in the ceiling, okay. so that. Um, Great. So. This is joint work with Mike Erickson, who's at the University of Cincinnati. It's uh, part of a long-term project that we have that I'll, I'll kind of guide you through, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk at the end about where we're, where we're going next. This part of the project is entitled Home Ownership of Old Age and at the End of Life. And um, a long-standing issue at the intersection of kind of public economics, urban economics, and the economics of aging is the extent to which the elderly uh, spend down housing equity as they age, as would be predicted by the simplest forms of the life cycle hypothesis. And um, just for those of you who aren't experts in this area, let me give you a really quick tour through, through this literature. It, it, starts in, it starts with the RHS, the Retirement History Survey, which was a panel study of individuals in their late 50s and early, late 50s to early 70s that occurred uh, in the 1970s. And early papers that looked at this, at, at this topic uh, typically, they're associated with Steve Venti and David Wise, uh, largely found that uh, homeowners don't extract equity as they age, either through, uh, either through any type of mortgage product or actually through selling their homes and, and liquidating the asset uh, uh, and hold. And uh, this, this presented in somewhat of an empirical model because uh, uh, what we would think as economists is, is that we wouldn't have had individuals who are the so-called house-rich income poor. Uh, that they're sitting on this big, big lump of wealth, as Jeff was saying, uh, and that, that, they, that they would want to monetize and spend down. Uh, but uh, then there were subsequent, there were subsequent studies with, with newer and better data, uh, and particularly those data track individuals to much older ages. You know, the early 70s is not necessarily very old if, if all this activity occurs among the oldest old. And so there were subsequent set of studies, many by, by Steve and David, uh, that found, uh, again, Similar findings, similar non findings, and then there were says, then there are other authors, uh, Lee Shaner, David Wilde, Jim Schilling has a paper that said, oh no, if you follow these people old enough, they actually do spend out of their equity. Uh, it, basically, the authors in this in this literature essentially agreed to disagree, and the literature stops about 20 years ago, and nothing's really done. Uh, but since then, uh, what we've had is. Uh, We've had a renewed interest in this area. Certainly, there's significant policy interest, as Jeff said, about the extent to which housing might supplement, actually, Jeff and Stephanie said, to which uh, housing might supplement the retirement income of, of future retirees. And indeed, there's been a lot of uh, renewed, in, renewed interest in work on reverse mortgages, much of which has been done by Don and, and, and Stephanie. Uh, and in macro, uh, since, the, since the Great Recession, macro economists actually started paying attention to housing and real estate. And there's actually a substantial amount of interest in, among macro economists in this. And so what, we, what, what Mike and I do is we return to this literature that's kind of been in standstill, and uh, we, re, we, we revisit this question with, we think, significantly better data, and I'll describe that. The data we're draw, are, are drawn from the HRS, as been described in the earlier two papers, the Health and Retirement Study. For those of you who don't know a lot about that data, uh, basically there are different cohorts. Uh, the cohorts basically are six-year birth cohorts. Uh, a new cohort enters the study every six years in their early 50s. These individuals are interviewed every two years until they die. Uh, and so it's a representative population of, of the, the 50 plus, uh, the 50 plus uh, Americans. There are about 38,000 individuals who've been surveyed through, through the HRS. And it has significantly larger samples among the oldest old, which makes it very attractive for revisiting this question. Uh, um, what we're going to use is we're going to use two sets of data in this analysis. The first is drawn from all cohorts from 1992 through the 2014 waves of the HRS. And um, what's really important for our purposes are that uh, the individuals are interviewed every two years until death. And then upon death, actually before, before you die, uh, if, you, if you move into a nursing home, a long-term care facility, or a hospice, they continue to interview you. 
And importantly for our purposes, so that's very important. And uh, the, second, the second important piece for our purposes is that uh, upon death, uh, you, you, are, you, are in, you are administered a, quote, exit interview. And the exit interview is an interview with your next of kin, which, which queries about uh, the, the, both the economic and health circumstances uh, uh, since the previous interview while you're alive and, 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 uh, and, and your death. And we're actually going to draw on, on those data. So uh, we're going to focus, uh, in this literature, the people focus has been on unmarried individuals. Uh, this allows, allows economists to sidestep rather thorny issues involving joint survivorship. We're going to actually follow that here. We'll talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing, what we're going to do next on that. And we're going to focus on the ownership of the primary residence. And we're, when, we, when we talk about ownership, the complement of ownership is non-ownership. It means you can either pay cash rent or you can uh, not pay cash rent, live in some cash-free situation. Typically, that's co, uh, a co-residence relationship, almost always with a child. And um, so we're going to define an owned rent transition as a move from ownership to non-ownership. 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 Non so let's start here with uh, this figure. Figure one, the solid line is the type of line that you would measure in, in any typical data set if you're looking at the age profile of home ownership. So remember that the typical data set, whether it's a, whether it's a census data set or, or, or the CPS or the PSID, um, they only interview people when, when, they're, when you're alive, right? And so this is what you're going to find. This is the solid line. And uh, as, as, was, was, uh, as Jen said in her opening remarks, homeownership peaks uh, in, in the mid-70s here uh, in age 70, uh, um, and then slowly declines, at, kind of declines at, a, at an increasing rate here. And one of the great things about the HRS is we can, we, we can measure age to quite old. These are by single years of age. The last point over here is 103-year-olds. That represents individuals who are 103 and older, we pool those people together. There are over 60 of these people. The oldest person in the HRS is 112. Okay? So we actually, you know, you actually get what's what's quite interesting about this is you get you get a, a downward sloping profile of home ownership. Uh, it doesn't go to zero, uh, but uh, it does go to about 12.5% uh, among the oldest old, which which uh, in comparison to this kind of this older literature does does pre would be prima facie evidence. Uh, if we could kind of go back in time, would be cream facial evidence that these individuals are following the, the life cycle hypothesis. And now, now what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to show you the 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 red dash line. The red dash line are is if we now incorporate individuals who are living in uh, at the time of the interview in a nursing home, long-term care facility, or hospice. These individuals are not surveyed in the CPS, and if they're surveyed in the census, they're they're they're, they're uh, they're not asked about home ownership because they're lumped into living in quote group quarters. So, so these are these are individuals who are not typically surveyed. We're going to add those in. Uh, now, um, uh, this is what they look like. Uh, um, the the short the short dash line here is the percent residing in a nursing home, long-term care facility, or hospice uh, by single year age, uh, and in, and not surprisingly, it rises quite uh, uh, quite steeply as as you get to the oldest old. And then this is the home ownership rate. Uh, for those individuals. Now, now, what does it mean to be a homeowner and live in one of these facilities? Uh, 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 um, we're thinking about we're thinking about ownership here not as as the residence, but as the as as the ownership of the of the asset. Okay, and a lot of individuals, certainly in in uh, in some of these care facilities, uh, they either uh, many of them uh, ex expect to come back into their ex ante expect to come back to their home. That's not necessarily what happens ex post, but but. But uh, for our purposes, we're counting these as homeowners. So what, what it does is it does the following. Uh, uh, as you can see, it lowers the home ownership rate, um, the measured home ownership rate here. Uh, and if we add in uh, the home ownership status of the decedents from the exit interviews, thank you, uh, from, from the exit interviews, uh, we find an even lower home ownership rate. Why is that? That's because most of the action, most of the home ownership transitions occur in your last year or two of life. And those would not be measured in a, in, a, in a survey where you're only querying the living. And so, uh, so if you if you want to see what what is the measure, what's kind of the overall impact of this, this um, the, this figure shows what the change from the, the standard measure of home of the home ownership rate would be from adding people in uh, in uh, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, and hospices. That's the red line. So think of it relative to a vertical uh, horizontal line at zero. 
That would be what we would typically measure. And this is the difference in, home, in measured home ownership rates by adding in these additional populations. And what you can see is, for individuals in their late 80s and, 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 and older, it has a, has a very large difference. You, we're, we're basically overstating the home ownership rate by about 10 percentage points. Uh, by not measuring people. So that's really quite, quite substantial. Home ownership is significantly lower than we would suggest. So if you go, again, if you go, um, if you go back to this figure, in the previous literature, we would, kind of, we would conclude that, uh, uh, that um, these older individuals were kind of following the life cycle hypothesis. Because in that literature, age is the sufficient statistic for whether you're following the life cycle hypothesis. The, the problem with that, with that is that um, that's not what, really what the life cycle hypothesis says. Life cycle hypothesis says that you should spend your assets down until the point at which you die, or if there's mortality risk, your expected date of death. And not everybody dies at really old ages of 100 to 95. So what we next do is um, we actually look at the distribution of dates of death in, in, in the HRS. So remember, these are, these are, this is conditional on being living to 50 and getting into the survey. And these are unmarried individuals. So a lot of these are the second to die in married couples. So you can see that a lot of people do die at, at, at ages that are not, would not be considered to be the oldest old. Um, so now what we do is we use, we use the, the panel data and we, we, make a different, we make a different figure. And this figure is, is the following. Um, it, it shows on a horizontal axis, zero is the date of death, and we're going back in time when you're living, if you read from right to left. The vertical axis here is the home ownership rate. And this shows what the, what the profile of the home ownership rate is as death approaches, as your actual death, not necessarily your expected death approaches. And you can see clearly that, that the home ownership rate uh, is not going to zero. Uh, at, at the date of death, uh, you know, still about 40% of, of the home ownership rate is about 40%. If you want to limit this to individuals who, who start into the survey as homeowners, among homeowners, uh, and who, who entered 1993, uh, so this is when they entered, uh, uh, there's 100% because they were homeowners. How many of them die in their homes? And, home, and that goes down to about 50%. So about half of, conditional on being a homeowner at age 70, you got your 50% of them are going to die in their homes. This is not at all accord with the life cycle hypothesis. There's got to be some other explanation. Of course, there's, a, there's, abundant, there's an abundance of explanations. Uh, you know, we know there's a strong desire to age in place. We know that Medicaid, uh, uh, Medicaid uh, 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 has safe harbor rules for, for uh, home ownership. Uh, we know there are insurance reasons. We also know that there are requests, there are request modes. There are lots of reasons, uh, tax, there are also some tax reasons as well, why you might die in your home. You also might die in your home because you die unexpectedly soon. Um, uh, and so, uh, so what we do is, um, uh, what we do is the following. The first thing is we calculate for, so 50% of these homeowners die in their home. What happens to that wealth? Well, it becomes bequeathed, OK? It becomes bequeathed. It's given almost universally to children. Uh, and, um, and how much wealth is being bequeathed every year among unmarried homeowners? About $100 billion. We calculate about $100 billion in bequests for unmarried homeowners. I mean, it fluctuates, as you can see. It fluctuates with you know, how, the value of, of housing. Uh, but, but it's a substantial flow of, of wealth that, that uh, that occurs. So the key question here is: a lot of this, a lot of housing assets are being uh, are being bequeathed. Uh, we, we focus. We don't focus on the other explanations, possible explanations we talked about. We do focus on requests. And we say, we say. Uh, so let's explore this. So the key question is: are these bequests intentional or unintentional? Uh, an intentional bequest. An uninten what's an unintentional bequest? That's simply you 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 uh, you anticipated you were going to spend the housing, but you died before you you could spend it. Okay. Uh, an intended request is you really did intend to give this, this swap away. So uh, what we do is we use questions in the HRS on, uh, on a medical diagnosis, functional status, and bequest intentions. And we actually model, uh, we model the, the, uh, the impact of bequest intentions on the likelihood that you're going you're gonna, to uh, sell your owner-occupied housing in, and transition into rental housing. So we're going to do this through a competing risks uh, 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 hazard framework, where the, key, the focal outcome is an owner-rent transition. And uh, the competing risks are that you you uh, you sell your you sell your own occupied housing and make an own to own transition. You buy another house, uh, and the other competing risk is that you die. Okay, so those are your competing risks, and we're going to do this just on what's known as the code cohort. Uh, um, and these are individuals who uh, are currently uh, about uh, 89 to 95 years old this year. Uh, the, for those of you who are experts in the HRS, the head cohort has some data measurement issues. We can have a sidebar about later. Uh, but we're focusing just on these. So these people are, not everybody in this cohort has died. 
Uh, so we do have some censored spells here. And um, this is just uh, this is uh, just kind of the, the basic basic model is we're gonna we're going to uh, model your the, the your bequest intention uh, and uh, let me just say how this is measured in the HRS. So the HRS asks this question: Using a number from one to one hundred, what do you think your chances are you will leave a financial inheritance? And they ask of, of it at all, at least of ten thousand dollars, at least of one hundred thousand dollars. We're going to use the ten thousand uh, dollar one. Uh, we're going to we're going to going to model your probability of making a own the rank transition as a function of of your request, your and your spouse's request intentions. We we take all unmarried individuals. We start we start them in the survey. You may be married, but then then we're going to we we. Everybody in the sample is eventually unmarried by 2014 or dead. Um, and um, for health shocks, uh, we're using the standard measure, which is, as a doctor told you, that you had X, high blood pressure, diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, et cetera. We use a very rich set of other controls. We have uh, limits to acti act activities of daily living. We have IADLs. Uh, we have income wealth, you know, a vast amount of, of of information. Uh, this is just to show you that we actually ran a regression, but I'm, uh, let me just tell you what we found. Basically, if you move from, if you go from being somebody who uh, has no intended request to one who's 100% sure that they're going to get a request of at least $10,000, uh, it reduces your likelihood of a uh, owner rent transition by about, uh, the, it, it, it shifts the hazard, the likelihood of an owner rent transition by about uh, 30%. Uh, how big is that? Uh, it's, that's big. It's big. It's statistically significant. It's big. It's robust inclusion of a vast array of controls. And um, how big is it relative to other known uh, triggers of moves among among older individuals? Well, it's about four times as big as widowhood. So it's a rather. It's, it's not just a statistically significant. It's an economically considerable effect. Um, and uh, so this is uh, another another kind of test that we do is the following. Among, if you thought the quest intentions were really important. Uh, um, what you would expect to find is the following. Among those individuals uh, who, who do transition from owning to renting, you, um, uh, we know among the elderly there's a vast array of rental arrangements, right? You can, you can just rent an apartment. You can rent, you can, uh, rent, rent a residence in, uh, uh, that where services are provided. People push in, and they, can, they provide an array of services. The HRS measures uh, about eight, eight services, right, Mike? About eight services that might be bundled in with your rent uh, uh, or your housing payment. So if you really believe that these, these intention, bequest intentions matter, you might also expect that if, if you've got a strong bequest intention, uh, that, uh, that it should affect your rental choice. In, in particular, do you go cheap, right? You want to hold on to your assets, do you go cheap? Or do you take the Cadillac rental where you've got all the services pushing in? And we actually, so we actually look at this uh, among those people who make an owner rent transition. What, what, uh, uh, what's the likelihood you choose a rental accommodation with assistant services, and then also the number of services. And uh, the question intentions are actually uh, a strong predictor. Uh, the economic magnitude of this is rather small, but it's statistically significant. And that's kind of an additional piece of information that it seems that the question intentions really seem to be driving housing decisions among, among, the, among the oldest souls. So um, in, in summary, what we do is this paper provides new estimates of the age profile of home ownership, which we think are really quite neat. Utilizing these data that nobody else has really looked at in this context, uh, homeownership is, is the homeownership rate is, is significantly lower among the oldest old than is traditionally measured, uh, and uh, uh, the majority of homeowners die in their homes. Where does that wealth go? It's bequeathed. Uh, it, it's it's about 100 billion dollars a year, and um, those bequest loans appear to be intentional, and they do appear to be an important driver. What does this mean for people who are interested, for example, in reverse mortgages? We know that there's not a huge demand for reverse. Well, we know there's not a lot of reverse mortgage activity. It's either because there's not a, a big demand or there are problems in the, on the supply side, uh, which have been well documented. Uh, this may be one reason why. It may just be that people, they don't want to, not because it's a bad product, but because they want to leave, they want to leave the loan uh, to someone else. And so uh, one of the things that we're doing going forward is we're expanding this to look at, uh, at uh, individuals who stayed married throughout the Throughout the uh, throughout the HRS and uh, expanding it to new cohorts, one of the interesting questions is: To what extent will will younger birth cohorts birth cohorts act differently towards their home equity than older birth cohorts? And there's at least some some people have speculated that uh, younger birth cohorts have, have are have in their life course used home equity more like an ATM 
They've done a lot more refis and things like that where they've taken equity out. When they get to be older, are they going to be more open to these potential new financial products? So, so we're, going to, we're expanding this to, to, to younger call votes. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, Michael Collins is ill and wasn't able to make it, so we don't have a respondent um, for Gary and Mike's paper, although we welcome your thoughts on it. Um, so I think maybe what we should do is gather everyone, um, the authors up here, and we'll uh, start the Q&A. So maybe as we did yesterday, if you have a question, University of North Carolina. I have a question for the last presenter. Um, um, I think it's common throughout the country, <laughs> certainly North Carolina, for a homeowner to sell their home, but then when they move to this continuum of care, they actually have to buy there. And when they die, the house reverts to their children. How do you categorize people like that in, your, in the data set? Right, so what, what we would track is we would track the sale of the first home and the purchase of the second. And we would track then the sale of the second home. Uh, or, or the transfer, if it's, tran if it's not sold, but it's, it's, it's the transfer to a child. That would all be tracked in the HRS. Yes. I do have another thought based on what you asked. I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that I think uh, Sue had mentioned and others mentioned is this idea of um, downsizing. And maybe you can answer this too, Mike. I mean, I, or sorry, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Looking at Mike and saying, Gary. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's not clear to me that there's always an option to downsize. So uh, it's not, and I, and I think Chris has made this point before you, the presentation was where you were looking at, I mean, particular housing markets, it's not clear that it would be more affordable for somebody to leave the home that they own. And in many cases, the homes, particularly among our, the reverse mortgage population that we've gotten to know, there's about a million of them, um, the homes that they live in are, are really not that high value homes. I mean, so it's not clear that they would actually be able to sell and live somewhere more cheaply, which is a supply issue. I mean, maybe this is raising a point that you, you mentioned. It's not that it's just let's convince them that they need to move. It's that we need to create supply that would be available to them. So that might be the solution. 
Um, but I just, when we look at the existing supply where folks live, I'm not sure that we can just tell somebody, don't get the reverse mortgage or don't do it, they move, they downsize. A, I don't know that they could downsize. They may already be in the small, and, and B, I don't know that they're going to save money by doing that. I don't know if you if you look at that at all. Uh, we, we looked at it, we looked at it. So we, Mike and I have looked at a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> they, they are, they're, they're, for those of you who haven't really worked with the HRS, they're very powerful data, but they're also very complicated. They're complicated in, in certain dimensions using the geographic coding. We're complicated in constructing these housing histories. They take, we basically, we're drawing information from about, about five, five parts of the survey, and we're actually, in some cases, piecing together real histories. It's very complicated because, because the, 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 housing, the housing behavior of older individuals is su substantially more complicated than you think. You know, about one sixth have second homes. Are you selling the first home or the second home? Which home is, are you reporting when, when, when the surveyor calls you or, or knocks at your door? And so we've looked at this one thing I want to caution about. When we say the word downsizing, what Stephanie is saying, she, she's, the idea she's conveying is that you have a smaller footprint in square footage. Uh, downsizing in the literature has typically been measured as value. But we all know that value is a mix between price and, price and quantity. And we can all tell stories about individuals who downsize, but the property they bought is significantly more expensive. Uh, because the neighborhood's more expensive, there are other amenities they're consuming, or, or they're actually consuming more in, internal interior amenities. So um, uh, what, you, what you see if you look at number of rooms which are measured, and other structural characteristics in nature, you do see evidence of, of spatial downsizing. But you don't see any value downsizing. I skipped over that figure. There's basically a figure. Yeah. There's basically a figure that there's there's no sense in which these individuals are are, are while they're homeowners, they're they're extracting any equity. It's all happening when they sell sell the asset. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the question of sort of what do we mean by either downsizing or changing. Um, changing either the structure type or the tenure or the characteristics of the neighborhood or the characters of that house, right? So those are all four dimensions that they could be changing. You know, and, and Sue and pointed out in particular, from a policy perspective, we'd like to think of matching older adults with structure types and maybe neighborhoods that are particularly friendly. So structures that are one level, that have elevators, neighborhoods maybe that have a, you know the particular kinds of amenities, healthcare and grocery stores and so forth, that are that don't require driving so people can you know potentially get rid of their car and not have to um, drive. But I'm thinking that this does depend a lot on the housing market they're in and whether those options are available. So if you live in a housing market that's mostly single family homes, the option of moving to something that's maybe a multi-family building with elevators may not exist, or the ones that are there are geared towards you know, students or something. And so it's not the social community that older adults would move to. Is the HRS big enough? Can you look at differences across housing markets and specifically identify housing markets where age-friendly structures and age-friendly neighborhoods exist? that people would have the option to move to that? So, <laughs> yes, one, potentially one could do this. How you would do it is you take the data uh, that, that, uh, that Velma and Patrick used, the, the geocode data, which goes down to the, goes down to the zip code level. Uh, and it goes down to the census uh, track level. You can get it at the census track level. And you would want to merge on, you'd want to merge on to that, like he did instead of uh, core logic, you'd want to merge on some some type of measures or indices of livability. And you could think of many ways we could construct this. And then, then you could really kind of tease out, okay, how, how quote, livable are these along these dimensions? These, neighbor, these are census tracts, so these neighborhoods. And you could think about if you want to draw concentric rings or whatever you want around these things uh, to get a, a sense of what's going on with your space. To my knowledge, no one's done that. Uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, no one has done it. Mike, Mike has. Mike has done a lot of what you said. He has geocoded. He, he, he's done a lot of this type of geocoding. We've never gotten there. We'll put it that does way. Sue and, you and Ingrid have a paper, do don't you? Do you have a paper that does this? We're, we're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're doing it. And when you quite, quite interesting. Yeah. 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 That's Mike, Mike has geocoded actual right. uh, longitude and latitude of residential buildings. Right. Um, 
<coughs> so you can always imagine an interesting extension of this paper. I think, what, five, six years ago, we, we started to do it, was looking at the opening of retirement homes and, and CCRCs and how that affects individuals at that micro level. Uh, what, maybe two, three years, we'll get to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Uh, so, uh, Keith, I'm from the FDIC. Two, two questions, if I might, with the mic. One, one for Gary. I would suppose that part of what might fuel the question tends to be sort of emotional attachment to the home, which may be proxied by time in the home. We talked about sort of this bundle of goods that we associate with the house, but that might be a, a you know an element of it. I wonder if that's something you can see in your data and speak to. And then to Patrick, I guess one of the things that I had a hard time following towards the end of your presentation, interested if you can comment on it, is. Uh, differences to the extent to which uh, households are accurately perceiving unexpected changes in their uh, their housing value versus not accurately perceiving it or at least reporting it. You know, particularly on the downside, homeowners are sort of, right, famously uh, reluctant to admit that their house has lost value. I mean, this I wish I had his voice. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to remember, so what we measure is actually the discrepancy between the observed and uh, projected, right? So it might be that this negative surprise is in fact when your house still gains value, it just gains less value than you thought it would gain, right? So it's, uh, it's a little bit different way how, it's difficult to actually use a, or, or come up with a short name, what those variables mean. Um, and like I said, the best explanation that we have for this asymmetric kind of a response is like, you know, again, how easy it is for you to, uh, you are experiencing this positive surprise, right? So the house appreciating value much more than we're expecting. It, expecting it's, uh, I think it's much easier to make a decision to reduce your contribution than it is in the opposite situation. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your house actually lost value. It, it simply means that the house did not appreciate as much as you thought it would, right? So, but I wonder if it might be interesting to decompose it across those different scenarios and see if it matters. It's, it's you know, plants, yes. Okay. So what about the perceived? I mean, I think part of the question was that perceived. You mentioned that they're perceived. Also, the perceived variable that we have was actually also, we also use the variable that is essentially self-reported self value of the house, right? Uh, so this was the ID model that we estimated. So we uh, we just wanted to see if there is a greater response if, if we measure not just the same average for everybody who lives in the zip code, but we actually use the you know, the very observation specific uh, sort of reported value of their house. And, uh, but actually we, what we found, what, so we haven't used this measure to kind of try to decompose whether there's a difference between what happens when it goes up versus when it goes down. Um, like we said, it's work in progress, so I think we'll do it because that's, that's where all the signs lead. There's going to be interesting stuff to uncover, so. So it's, it's difficult to tease, to tease it out. Um, 
In terms of, of your first comment, the, the hazard framework it has embedded in it uh, the how long you've been in, the duration of how long you've been in the house. So that's embedded in it. Uh, but what we don't show you is how that how that baseline hazard changes because this is a this is a proportional hazard. We actually don't estimate the baseline, but we could do that. Um, uh, final comment on those uh, rosy picture of homeowners about the, you know, how they appraise the value of their house. <coughs> there was a very interesting paper a few years ago in the Journal of Consumer Affairs. It was actually coming from the Netherlands. And uh, the way, or the reason why it was interesting, because there is a law in the Netherlands that actually, so the government makes an appraisal of your, of your house value. And even though the government tells people exactly what the value of their house is based on some algorithm, uh, almost everybody has a mark, much more optimistic view of, it's actually a big discrepancy. I think it's about in the magnitude of almost 10 percent. I don't remember the details. So. Well, Don and I have a paper. Actually, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about it, but we actually do see a perspective. Very recent right? paper. Yeah. yeah. Looking at seniors and their evaluation of their self-reported house value compared to an appraisal, yeah. um, arm's length appraisal, and we find, first of all, that either an up and down period it's lagged, um, as you'd expect, but it's. Um, more severe, it, it, and it's wrong by about 16% on average, um, but it is more severe during a downturn. They really don't think their house has declined as much. So, um, directly relevant for and what And this drives behavior about. to the point. It means we actually also see it drives here. So these are all people that are in the process of applying for reverse mortgage, and they back out when they overestimated their house value, and then they find out it's worthless, even if they could still get it. So you're controlling for whether they would still be eligible for the reverse mortgage once they find out about that actual loss of value, they, they back out of the decision. Which makes me wonder if you should be looking at, so I was wondering about your paper, if you should be looking at perceptions, if, if, if you're going to drive your decisions to uh, save less, it seems it's your perception that should drive that, should not, not the actual shock. Right. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And that's why, so it's, uh, I'm a little bit troubled by the fact that we actually don't find people yeah. update those perceptions based on, you know, what is the unexpected element? Yes, in yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, definitely we have to sort this out. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to combine this comment with the papers you actually wrote. Um, <laughs> but the age group you are studying um, from the 50s on are often um, positively and perhaps normatively uh, the right group to be landlords. Um, you don't find many very young landlords. Um, and they are, they are, if you go in the HRS, they frequently are landlords. They are making decisions about owning investment property. They may turn their, their current home into an investment property and live somewhere else. Um, if, they, if they sell them, if they, if, they, if they move, they may not sell, they may rent it out. Um, somehow that should be part of, uh, of the calculus, and I'm not quite sure how you would combine that, how you would enter that fact in, in the kind of work you're doing. Yeah, so what we do, we, we thought a lot about that. Uh, what, what Mike and I have done is we tried to basically put together a property by person panel where we track your second home, your rental properties, things like that. It's it's uh, it's it's very it's very challenging to do. What we do is is our measure of home ownership is the home. Uh, do you own the home? Do you own the residence that you claim to be in that way your primary residence? So if you have a if you have a if you have a house, you have, you buy another house. In uh, in one way, if you have a house that you own, you buy another house uh, that you move to, and you own it in the second way. That starts a new residential spell. Uh, and the old spell ends, but it's a spell. It's a com it's a combination of, of of ownership of the primary residence that still is in your portfolio, being included in your portfolio. So we're tracking those properties, and we're and we're tracking the HRS actually tracks whether you sell the first property or not, or or, or even whether you give it away. So we're we're actually able to do that. It's it's to, to, to assemble the data is quite complicated because the HRS didn't make this easy. But that's what we did. So, you know, again, the data assembly here was really arduous, uh, especially for what we did, tracking these residential spells. If you've ever done this in survey data, it's really complicated. 
So, um, but yeah, we need to account for that. You can go to Lynn and Don. Um, just a quick question for the whole panel. Um, in reverse mortgages have come up a number of times, um, and I, I didn't hear anybody talk about refinancing, refinancing cash out. I just wonder if that's in the data, if that's something you're paying attention to. I know it means you have to pay, you know, there's a payment involved, but to the extent that people are living longer, working longer, you know, maybe that's, and, and it also seems sort of, for Ronda and Patrick, it's a competing risk, right? It's, it's another way that you could, yeah, so I just didn't hear anybody talk about refinancing. What kind of behaviors are you seeing? So we actually do measure with refinancing as part of the, the mode of cashing out. So you did the extraction of equity, the first thing you see, HELOC to the primary form. Cash out refinancing is the second most dominant form. And actually, they're pretty close. Um, and then the third would be taking out a second lien. Um, and we have another paper where we've looked at cash out refinancing who's using the New York Fed credit panel data among seniors, looking at the types of individuals who cash out, refi seniors who cash out refinance versus HELOC. And you actually find, I mean, particularly this was during, you know, the, the heyday of subprime lending, but the cash out refiner were often looked more, uh, had lower credit scores um, than the HELOC borrowers by, by quite a bit, almost a 100 point differential. Um, so they tended to be both to be able to get the by the HELOC that were cash out refinanced in that, in that case. Um, and then you see their outcomes over time. Um, the cash out refinancers were actually more likely to end up in a foreclosure. This is up seniors, were more likely to end up in a foreclosure situation later versus the, the HELOC borrowers or others. Gary, your bequest question in the HRS, you said something about financial bequest. The, word, the wording the HRS uses is financial inheritance. Financial inheritance. And so what do you think seniors do with when they're thinking about giving their house to their kids? Is that going to be included in there, or are they going to say, no, you're talking about giving them $5,000 and the house is different? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. We don't know. We use this as, you know, you can either take it literally, financial means everything, or you can take it as, uh, this is your intention to leave something. Uh, and then we infer that, well, if you die in your home, you left, you left it. In fact, in the exit, they do leave it. They leave it to the kids. But it's a great question, and we wish that it was done better. Uh, there's, there's, that's just a little bit of question. Is, is there any way to tell what percentage of older adults actually intend to leave their house to their children and the children reside in the house? There's no, there's no direct way to do it among those who haven't done it. We can ex post look at people who left their house, people who've given their house to their kids, uh, you can, the inter vivos transfer, but we can't, we can't have, there's no way to do it ex ante short of putting a special module in uh, to, to measure it. I mean, that's, that would be prospectively how you might address it. But no, there's no way to do that. Um, let's get Hannah over here and then we'll move to the other side. Although I was going to say, Don, I, I will say, if, if, if you, you know, in, in Jeff's comments and in Swin's comments and in Jen's comments, you know, we know that the elderly don't have much more than their entitlements to Social Security, private pension, and housing. There's very little place to give to most of these people. So, you know, if you don't have any other financial assets and you're asked to give financial inheritance, then that might lend, lend some credence to your, your thinking about the house issue. Gary, I just want to correct one thing. You, um, the, the HRS does have a question on leaving the house. Um, and. Uh, Jackie wrote her dissertation on it, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's lumped in with the class expectation question. It's part of it as including any property you own. Yes, right. yes, so, yes. So, and yeah, so I, my, one of my dissertation papers was okay. looking at the, the There it is. Question. I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong, but, but we're better. <laughs> um, hi, this is Hannah Thomas from Apt Associates. Um, I think one of the questions that comes up for me, and particularly Gary with your paper, is around um, looking, thinking about the racial implications, right? Um, and I was curious if you had, um, did an analysis, I imagine you did or maybe you didn't present it, but the, sort of race, the racial breakdown of uh, the population in, in, in or your sample, um, and how that, play, how that played out in terms of, or might play out in terms of policy implications. Right, so, uh... 
in terms of the composition of the sample, all individuals are included if you were ever unmarried. If you ever were observed to be in the panel unmarried, even if you started off married, or if you started off unmarried and became married and were unmarried later. So we include everyone, all, so all racial, cat, racial and ethnic categories that are measured in the HRS are in there. Um, when, uh, as control variables in the, in the hazard models, we have bridge that includes that. But more to your point, we have not broken this out by race to see if there are differential impacts uh, across different groups. Um, it's, it's something we haven't done. I think it's interesting. So, so in a related paper, um, I mean, there's such big disparities, though, for housing equity, uh, especially of uh, non-white households, that I, I imagine the sample would be quite small to the start. I, I would say, though, that housing equity is a larger portion of wealth for those that are minorities. So we actually see you know, in our data that that's actually comprises the majority of wealth for, okay. for, for uh, black homeowners. Um, it's not, they don't have many financial assets at all. It's, it's all of that. It's something that could be done and should be done. Yeah. We, we yeah. should be done. Yeah. Yeah. Just on this point, I hand the scoop me, so I was going to ask the same question. But, uh, I just think that that data, uh, we found that, um, shockingly, a white high school dropout has the same level of retirement savings as a black with a graduate or professional degree. It's stunning. So I, I really urge to continue looking at these disparities by race and ethnicity uh, within these retirement discussions. Uh, two questions. Uh, first for Patrick, uh, you flashed through the uh, descriptive statistics, but I think I saw that the average income was $160,000 or something like that. And uh, we know not uh, by a long shot does everyone have a 401k, so I wonder how generalizable your findings are um, to a broader population. Uh, so there is also obviously a representative of only those people who are in the HRS and it's 50 plus, so that itself is going to skew income up a little bit. Uh, most of the descriptive statistics actually, uh, when we compare them to other surveys, they are very comparable in this age group. Um, I have more concerns about the chronology data. Uh, those observed house prices, they are a little bit higher than average. So you have to, I guess, sort out you know, the details of the reporting, because I think there is a big missing component, especially in intra-rural areas and zip codes. Um, but otherwise, I don't really have uh, concerns about generalizability from each other. the average income on the or something? Let me check. Yes, so that, 162. So is it only It is 162. Mm -hmm. And, but remember that, so, you know, our estimation sample is, in fact, those who are employed, right? So we are, we are looking at people who have very strong labor force attachment, uh, even though they are older. Uh, so that doesn't make it unrealistic for this specific group, right? And, well, and again, it's only people. because of, you know, the, the flow of retirement savings are only available for those who actually have those plans with their current, current employers, right? And on top of this, it's you know estimation technique, the fixed effects, so we have to have consecutive waves of data. So it is those people who have very strong labor force attachment. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so it's representative just in a very small chunk. And have not moved over the time. Right. Uh, a question for Gary. Um, you, you know, we hear a lot in the uh, supply of affordability uh, discussion about baby boomers staying in their house too long and not, uh, not selling and making housing available for first time home, home buyers and so forth. Um, does your work capture that, you know, the sort of retention of housing, whether it's for aging in place or conversion to uh, rental, which of course produce, can produce income for older homeowners too? No. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have an answer. Yeah, exactly. I pass the mic up. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, we've not looked at, we've not looked, dealt into some of those issues. Um, and in, some of those are difficult issues. And they, in principle, the data could be used, I think, to get at some of them. But no, we haven't, we haven't looked at that. Um, 
because I think uh, Sue and <coughs> Steve being in place, which I think is really true, is that um, we don't really know what people think their options are if you ask them if they want to be in place. And so if we had the sort of thing that someone was talking about, would we have more interest in moving? Um, although given all the constraints that we've also talked about, which is it can be more expensive to move to a smaller footprint, but accessible, centrally located. Um, this question, I think, mostly for, for either Gary or Stephanie. I think, my memory, if memory serves, there's some risk tolerance and time horizon variables in the HRS, and have you found sort of any correlations of what you're looking at in with the risk tolerance variable and whether or not the reluctance to draw down is also about being afraid of outspending what you have left? not in this analysis, but I'm controlling for those. Um, and so the, the general story that's told is the reason why the elderly hold on so much well so late in life is because they have strong precautionary motives against uninsured medical expenses. Those wouldn't be acute care costs. Those are covered by Medicare, but those would be long-term care. And um, so, and you know, Medicaid eligibility is for relatively low income. So essentially these individuals are self in the absence of uh, well-functioning long-term care markets where there is substantial informational problems <coughs> that um, these people are essentially self-insuring. That's kind of the standard narrative. What's interesting here is that um, one of the things that the, that the exit interviews do is they ask, they ask about the circumstances surrounding death and they ask about, well, how did the person die? Okay, was it, was it a sudden death? Was it expected? Was it unexpected? What did they die from? And we map, we actually match also the National Death Index. And if you kind of did, if you kind of split the analysis by people who were who were uh, had had you know terminal illnesses that were identified versus people who just had a heart attack and essentially died, you don't see really a lot of difference. And that now that's not exactly the test you're looking for, but it's kind of some prima facie evidence that maybe these precautionary motives aren't quite as strong as we think. And, um, but I think that's a really interesting thing to look at. I think that we, that one potentially could do that for both of these studies, yeah. yeah. As a predictive of borrowing, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. One thing I think about is whether, the, in terms of Jeffrey, but this is to um, the lady next, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. You know, thinking about a house quite differently from others. Um, Jeff's on the phone. Jeff has had his like, final question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I had <laughs> um, whether because of emotionally, you know, connections to the home or, you know, the long-term care edge, or like, you know, they think that house as an asset is way different than other assets is what I'm hearing through all these papers. But I'll, I'm sorry, I'm taking more time. Um, uh, I live in Newton, one of the rich western suburbs of Boston, where every kid is above average. It's one of those kinds of towns. <laughs> Um, and luckily, I bought my house 30 years ago, or I couldn't afford to live there now. But one of the big issues is, in our town, is the lack of supply of units that the seniors can downsize to. So I think that's really a big issue here in terms of looking at home ownership uh, for older age. Um, I work at the uh, our food pantry, and we did a survey of our clients. And we found out that access to our food pantry did, went a long way towards reducing food insecurity. So I don't know to what extent you're able to con account for that in your data, because I think it's actually a very important component of it. So. We do have that. Very few people report in the HRS using. So we have Meals on Wheels. We have, I think, Visit at a Food Pantry. There's a variety of different social programs. We've added those in at different times. I mean, they're a little bit endogenous, um, so you have to be careful. But but yeah, there is just such a small number in the HRS that report doing that. But um, I mean, we have yeah. seniors as a major. Yeah. Yeah, really, really well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> then you can move. <laughs> you'll, you'll find me there. I'm on the mm. or so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've got the last apartment left in Newton. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Stephanie. Um, 
Did you look at what precipitated using the the equity? I mean, it, it seems like you know you you have a fixed income, so in general you either on average be in trouble or not, and so something may have changed because you use that equity. And then, and then does that mean that in any way that bias the effect downward? Because if you got an average person to use their equity, it actually have a much bigger effect. I'm just kind of wondering about and they use it in emergency, they have to spend it on that emergency, and so it doesn't help as much as maybe because of right. without that yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have a first stage is predicting the borrowing, and so there's certain factors that are predictive of borrowing, including um, lower financial assets is predictive of borrowing, but higher income, ironically. So there has to be some level of income to borrow, but then lower, um, higher home equity. Um, we actually didn't find that the house price shock was leading to, and this uh, looked at our first stage right before the, it, that wasn't actually significant. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, um, depending on the model. Um, prior borrowing is, is predictive, and uh, prior delinquency, you're less likely to borrow. But I think I actually wrote a note down, and I, I mean, and I, I know we've added these at one point, we had health shocks in the model, um, because I mean, it, it, like Minerva and others have suggested that health shocks are really the precipitating factor to borrowing. Yeah. And so trying to think about what's happening here, like they're not getting out a loan to go buy food, they're getting out a loan to do something right. that's helping them with smooth consumption for other things, including food. And so it could be the health shock, um, and that's then, and so I, I know we've added that at one point, but I think we should add it back um, <laughs> in the first stage. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Well, we're about at 10 o'clock, so I um, want to thank the panelists for three really interesting papers that really go well with each other and to the discussions as well. Thank you. So we have a half an hour break. We'll be back here at 1030. I think there's snacks outside to refresh yourself. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.